everyone. Welcome to my talk. Um, my topic for today is uh, about MQTT. So really, it's really the benefits of MQTT for IoT apps and beyond. And uh, just a little bit about myself first. So who is Mary, right? So I'm actually a returning speaker. So it's really been like an honor to be back again this year for the Techno International Women's Day um, you know, the conference, uh, so really happy. So thank you so much again for the organizers, for, um, you know, the, the, the producer and the, the video person to be helping me. So thank you very much. And I am a lead developer advocate, uh, currently actually at a, uh, a company that actually I'm switching to a data management company that specializes in big data, streaming and the cloud native platform. And I'm based in Chicago. And I'm also a Java champion and also a president and executive board member of the Chicago Java Users Group. I also help uh, to co-organize some of the meetups too for a few of the IBM based uh, sponsored meetups in the Chicago area. And my experience too is that I have over 25 years of experience as a uh, developer, at, uh, no, actually, as a software engineer. Uh, I have done product development, uh, application development uh, in all phases of development. In fact, uh, in, including even like testing and integration. Uh, most recently too, before becoming a developer advocate, I was helping out with the DevOps uh, pipeline, things like that. And my areas of specialty are mostly in Java and also distributed messaging, reactive, uh, cloud-enabled distributed messaging systems. And those are my uh, interest area. And if you'd like to follow me on Twitter, I welcome you to do that. This is my uh, Twitter handle. And then my LinkedIn profile as well as, um, I also do live coding on Twitch. Every Wednesday, I'll have my slide up again for the link. So even if you miss it now, it's okay. And then I also have my Discord server if you want to join me in more conversation. So, and with that, let me begin. So today's agenda, I'm going to be talking about essentially IoT. And then MQTT is uh, really an ideal protocol for doing IoT messaging. Uh, so I'll then discuss about what is MQTT, right? Some history about it, uh, it being a community-driven specification. Um, and there's there are also like specifically MQTT version 3, 3.1.1, the features, and then also MQTT 5, features too. And then some use cases for MQTT and some alternative protocols uh, for IoT, like what are some of the other ways of doing, you know, internet uh, of things messaging too, other than MQTT. And then I'll kind of summarize in terms of the benefits and the strengths of MQTT for IoT uh, applications and beyond. And then a bit of a demo too, towards the end. First of all, let's take a look into the IoT stack. Now for me, when I first started working on the IoT, and that was actually beginning of the year, this year in January, I remember too, I, you know, even right before that too, I was thinking, oh, IoT seems like, you know, the, the hot things right now. So when I look up, right, now, first of all, in my mind, I was thinking of devices, you know, Raspberry Pi, little sensors and things like that. It is very true, no doubt. However, at the same time too, when I was searching around, especially on meetup groups, a lot of the meetup groups too, as some of you may be already aware, is that there are meetup groups or IoT, and they seem to be specifically too for AI and data science and things like that. So I was like, at first I'm like, well, how did they get related? Now, as I'm kind of studying more, that's why I'm doing the slides is that from 30,000 feet, if we look into the IoT stack, to me, it really um, encompassing um, everything, you know, in the whole computing universe, if you can kind of think of it like that. But <clears throat> let's first take a look too. So again, you know, if we look from the top layer down into this small kind of a layer, if you look at this too, I look, I kind of have kind of um, divide up, right, this IoT uh, stack. And I look at the top layer that's really solutioning on that layer. There are essentially two, broadly speaking, there are three main uh, subcategories and they are not limited to these three, but that's just how I interpret it. And essentially is the consumer um, kind of aspect, which kind of involves your home applications, lifestyle, mobility, entertainment, for example. So say consumer in your home, right? You can have um, some kind of sensor that control the lighting if you're you know, leaving 
for the day for work, then it will turn off your light and things like that. When you come home, it will automatically turns on. So that requires sensor. So how do we know how would the light knows to be turned on, right? It's, it's because of sensors that sends all this data to the servers, so to some server. So that's one aspect of it, and that's an example. Um, and then there's also then the second second category would be more of an enterprise type of um, environment. Let's say you know we're doing like uh, sales and business op operations and ERP marketing, all these things. You can make use of also IoT too. Like you want to have some ways of measuring, uh, send do some sensing data, things like that. So that's more of the enterprise category. And then there's also this category is more of an industrial side of things. Um, they are kind of include, right, including, but not limited to like manufacturing, uh, automotive, such as like connected cars, you know, logistics and like construction industry, oil and gas pipelines, things like that, right? So there are factory automation, and that's what is also called the industrial IoT. And then um, all these things, right? So these are more solutioning kind of layer. So now if you kind of go down, right, there's cognitive platform, which is really then that's where the AI comes from, right? Voice recognition, AI interactions, right? Doing uh, spoken things and gestures, you want to be able to capture that and send the data to some server. And then, then you go, Further down would be more of the analytics uh, platform that kind of deals with like reports, you know, events uh, that happens and machine learning, stream processing, a, a bit more kind of getting down into the computing layer now. Now, the thing is too, now let's kind of look at the bottom layer now. It's essentially, they, they are the devices. They are really the physical devices, right? That gathers all of these data, smart devices, sensors, actuators, embedded devices, right? Things that that's what I was kind of first think, thought of too. And it's IoT, I always immediately think of this layer. But in order for this layer to be able to communicate, then it re rely on the communication protocol level. I kind of use, kind of um, lay, lay this out too as a um, kind of one layer, but that layer too, essentially too, encapsulates all of the OSI, the networking, OSI, open systems interconnect um, networking, seven layers too. So that includes an MQTT, and that's the kind of subject matter of today. MQTT is really, it stands for message uh, queuing telemetry transport. So it's essentially two is a protocol, right? That helps with uh, IoT device de to device to device communication or machine to machine communication. Now there are also other protocols too, like CoAP, uh, AMQP, DDS, XMPP, and then Essentially, too, when you kind of work with internet, right, there's also HTTP, too, which I did not list here. So, again, these are just some examples, too, like, as to how MQTT kind of stack up against the other uh, protocol. Now, the thing is, too, as you look further down, you know, into my list of example would be IP, IPv4, V6, all of these things, and Bluetooth, you know, and Bluetooth, too, and in fact, too, they don't kind of follow the OSI uh, layer, if you're familiar with it. It actually has its own model too, but it kind of simulates what the OSI is, except because it makes use of radio waves too and things like that. So, well, just a little bit of background. And then GSM, Modbus, all of these are more industrial level of communication protocol. Now, the thing is too, then there's also, you know, from the protocol side too, then, then what protocols is only protocol. It won't work without actually more of the core platform. And that's where IoT messaging middleware, such as the company that I've been serving is called uh, HiveMQ based in Germany. They are actually the, the uh, MQTT um, kind of a, a major player, so to speak, you know, in terms of vendor in this space. So they provide IoT messaging middleware for enterprise type of scenarios. And then there are other core platforms, things like protocol gateway, data aggregation, data storage. All of these are more about infrastructural type of capability in this computing stack. So with that, let's kind of get into the details of MQTT. So what is MQTT, right? <clears throat> Essentially too, is on the protocol layer. As I mentioned on the OSI uh, seven layers, it is actually on the top layer, which is the application layer that kind of connects the devices with actually the networking side and make your applications work. So is, it is a standard binary uh, publish subscribe messaging protocol that's designed for fast and reliable data transport between devices, especially under very constrained conditions. So con constraint conditions is really the key in here. So what is that, right? Essentially, it 
include like unreliable network connectivity, uh, limited bandwidth, and limited battery power and limited memories, all of these resources essentially too. So it's really designed to run in very minimal type of conditions, so to speak. And even with network going up and down, MQTT can handle like the transfer of data very well uh, and reliability too. So, and it is built on top of TCP IP. It's really ideal for the internet of things. Now, as you can see, I'm borrowing this uh, diagram from uh, hyphen Q, you know, and, and if you look into it too, it's makes use of the PubSub protocol. So as, as uh, you may be aware, right, PubSub is essentially, it involves a broker in between. So the broker, think of it like a post office. Now publisher is the one that needs to send messages out. But instead of telling, you know, the broker where to send the messages to, I'm basically almost seems like kind of a broadcast kind of thing. Not quite exactly, but the thing is too, is that I go, I tell the broker that, okay, I have these messages I want to send out. And then you lay out all of the parameters essentially. And the broker too, um, will immediately too, kind of be able to tell who will be the interested uh, recipients. And they are really the ones that subscribe to the messages. In order to be able to do this kind of model, then you rely on what is called the message will have topics related to it. And think of it more like a label, right? So it's like you go to the post office, instead of writing address of the recipient, you basically have labels. So you label the messages, certain topics. So then those recipients who are interested in the messages will subscribe to the topic. And then based on certain parameters too, then the broker will then deliver these messages accordingly. So that's what essentially is doing. And this particular example in here is that, for example, like a speed meter, um, it will be constantly be publishing uh, data to the broker. And then there will be subscriber that subscribe to it. For example, you know, if you're kind of doing a mapping kind of facility, uh, kind of thing, and you want to be able to receive the data um, at your with your uh, vehicle at certain times or, or things like that, then you you want to be able able to subscribe to the to the relevant topics and receive those messages. So that's what essentially it is. Now, a bit of a, a brief history of MQTT too. It was actually invented in 1999 by Andy Stanford Clark uh, at IBM with his partner, Arlen Nipper, who actually uh, wasn't working for IBM then. And back then they were working on a consulting project. And the, top, the, the project actually was about um, dealing with uh, oil pipelines, uh, their data that's kind of traveled through oil pipelines. And they need to collect those um, data uh, uh, via satellite. So basically it's very limited kind of operating environment too. And so Andy and Arlen both decided while well, there weren't actually, wasn't any like good protocol. So they designed this MQTT to address that. And they used the name of MQ, which is actually goes after IBM's uh, message queuing uh, series, right? And they call it MQTT, um, T stands for telemetry uh, transport because telemetry deals with um, essentially gathering all the data and then also the transport side of things too. So, so that's how they name it. Now, let's kind of take a look at kind of a timeline too. So in 1999, that's when the MQTT came out. It was actually designed for oil pipeline and for monitoring type of purposes uh, under very constrained environment. <clears throat> now, the thing is too, it, um, then over time too, then internet became more uh, prevalent, right? And uh, rising of internet, there are different needs for the having device to device communications, machine to machine kind of communication. So in 2010 too, essentially too, there have been companies that started looking into MQTT and essentially adapted that for use in IoT type of scenario uh, kind of uh, applications. So, so MQTT 3.1 opened as royalty-free protocol in 2010. And in 2012, then Mosquito, Mosquito uh, from the Eclipse Foundation 1.0 got released. And soon after that too, or, and it was uh, 2013, that's when HiveMQ uh, 1.3 got released. Now I wanted to highlight HiveMQ besides the fact that I'm, I work for them, but they also are kind of a, more of a pioneer of a vendor to develop uh, uh, this uh, high uh, the, the MQTT broker too. So they are kind of, uh, they, they also in, in uh, help out too with the OASIS, uh, which is a the open standard committee for uh, community driven specification, right? So 
in 2013, so Oasis uh, technical committee was formed for a bunch of uh, vendors that were interested to start uh, contributing to these community-driven specifications for MKTT. So in 2000, that was in 2013. Then in 2014, MKTT 3.1.1, which actually was a major release because um, it encompasses a couple of very core functionality of this protocol, and which I will be talking about in just a minute or so. So that got officially released in 2014. And then 2018 was, was when uh, MKTT 5 uh, came out officially released then. And MQTT 5 to it, I will also uh, touch on a few key features of it. It's essentially more kind of catered for the cloud native uh, timeframe. So I'll talk a bit about some of those features. And then in 2018 too, uh, HiveMQ 4 came out and actually then it has uh, MQTT 5 support. Okay, so here's the, the, uh, the companies that have made up, uh, the, they are kind of core members of the MQTT technical committee. Now bear in mind too, this is open uh, kind of community. So um, it, it isn't like limited for um, like, you know, these companies, but the thing is that these nine companies are the core members. So they are obligatory uh, type of members. They need to be voting and things like that too. But anybody essentially can join and contribute and participate and, and kind of watch some of their, or participate in some of the committee meetings too. So I kind of wanted to point out to that. So as you can see, these are the companies and then HypeMQ is also a major player in here. Okay, so now then let's get into a bit of the MQTT overview. So it is an IoT messaging protocol and it's got three QoS, which stands for quality of service levels. Now, bear in mind that this is actually very important in kind of any kind of messaging um, protocol. As you know that if we're doing messaging, uh, a lot of times to messaging deals with like a synchronous style of uh, message sending, right? From the sender to the server uh, or to the receive receiver. It is very important that you need to have mechanism to guarantee delivery of messages. So in MQTT, it makes use of three levels of uh, quality of services. And then there are also uh, retained messages uh, functionality, and then also the stateful persistent uh, sessions uh, type of functionality, as well as the fact that MKTT is very lightweight, it's binary with very minimal overhead. So basic features of MKTT 3.1.1. Now again, uh, this we will start with the 3.1.1 because that's the first kind of major release that's still being heavily in use by a lot of the MKTT uh, clients in today. Uh, so first of all, pops up. So if you look into a pops up uh, type of systems, as you can see, I mentioned also earlier about the broker. The broker essentially is like the server, right? It, it receives commands um, and then it acts on it accordingly. And then any other things that tries to communicate with this uh, broker is called a client. So whether you are a publisher or you are a subscriber, you are a client, um, an MQTT client to the MQTT broker. So. In order to communicate to between the two, there are commands being sent. Essentially two, there are three main uh, commands. One is connect and then the other is subscribe and, and publish. The way it works is that when you connect uh, from the client to the, to the broker, the broker will send back an acknowledgement. Uh, for example, like connect, then it will be a connect act. And then if you do subscribe, then it's a subscribe act acknowledgement, right? And then same thing too, if you try to publish to it, then the broker will have to send back an acknowledgement. But I also kind of describe too, not all uh, cases require an acknowledgement. So I will take a look into the QoS level in the next few slides. But let's kind of also review a little bit too about the broker, if you recall, right? That's a like a post office uh, kind of server. I'm here to serve you kind of thing. And so the publisher will be sending all of the data over to the broker and it publishes, right? For example, a temperature sensor will be publishing the, the uh, certain temperatures and send it over to the broker. And it's up to the, the kind of subscriber, whoever is interested in the um, data, they need to subscribe to the topic that in which, you know, from which the data is being sent to by the publishing side. So then now when the data arrives, then broker then will deliver and send the messages over, essentially push it to the laptop in this particular case and or like a mobile devices. 
uh, device, right, in this case. So, so that's kind of quick overview. And let's kind of take a look to, first of all, about uh, a packet. Let's get back into a packet level. So again, these are dealing with communication protocols. So now let's take a look into the data packet itself, right? So if you take a look into the connect and then a connect act, act, right, acknowledgement, you see that the client will send uh, data over to the broker, it sends a connect, and then the broker gets it, you know, in time, and then it will send back a con act, it's acknowledge it. So if you take a look inside a packet, this connect will con contain the client ID, and then also a clean session uh, uh, indicator in here, a Boolean value of true or false. And then there are a bunch of like optional uh, parameters such as like username, password, but most of the time we do want username and password. And by the way too, this is also being encrypted too, so. And then there are also like last will topic and we'll take a look into the last will thing shortly. Uh, but as you can see too, these are the different, uh, you know, kind of ex example of last will messages of these fields. And then there's also a keep alive. It's basically saying that, okay, this is the time that I will wait, you know, for the response. If not, then I'm going to resend kind of uh, indicator from the client to the server. Now, the thing is too, once the broker receives these messages, then it will needs to acknowledge by sending back to the sending client another packet that kind of contains the session present and also a return code. Now, let's take a look then at the publish subscribe, right? In this particular case, the publish uh, will basically send out with the packet ID. It identifies, right, I, myself, I'm that packet, and then I need a topic, right, that labels this message. In this case, and for example, you, you, use, you usually will use kind of hierarchical, will be topic slash something. The topic, it can be any name too. It's basically hierarchical, at least kind of two levels, the topic name. And then there's QoS is the quality of service. Retain flag is this message to be retained. Payload is the actual messages that you want to send, right, to your recipient side. And then dupe flag is essentially telling, is this a duplicate message? Now on the subscriber side then, the subscriber will then be sending, right, if, if somebody is interested in, in this, um, you know, kind of message, then it will contain the packet ID. And then also then uh, it can have like multiple topics too, that each topic too, you also want to indicate what's the quality of service for each topic that you want to subscribe to. As you can see too, one MQTT packet for a subscribe can actually subscribe to multiple topics all at once within the packet too. Now, there's also this concept of will. So essentially it's about last will and testament. So think of it this way, right? Client too can all of a sudden be disappearing, right? No longer exists kind of like that. So it has a concept of what's called like last will, you know, and, and a testament. So basically it's the client will basically define this last will and testament. It's like the will kind of. So essentially too is telling the broker that, well, I'm sending this message, message but in the event that I die, then basically too, um, please, send it for me, you know, and basically it's the last will, it's basically the message that should be sent, you know, in the case that this client dies. So the broker will send the message if this client dies. So if it doesn't die, then it won't be sent. It is a real kind of push type of way of doing things because, you know, once it's died, then basically the broker will know about it, then it will do a push and push it to all of the subscriber that are subscribing to this topic, right, uh, from, from this particular push client or, or kind of publish client. It's useful to implement any kind of on-off mechanism in a safe way. And then uh, it actually will message when subscribing to the topic. Now take a look in the packet too. Um, same thing, right? The packet, the connect packet will have the client ID, whether it's a clean session or not, and then all of the username. And then basically last will topic will then contain uh, what is this topic, you know, for this last will. And then what's the quality of service? And then the message that uh, you want to send out in the event that this client dies. And then keep alive is let's say 60 seconds in this particular case. There are also the concept too of retain the message. So retain message is slightly different. It's basically too is that it's it, it's not about the client dying or not in this case. It's more about the good value. So basically, the you're telling the broker that the last message I sent, please retain it, keep it, right? It will be stored on the broker side. 
And this way too, then the client um, will then, uh, well, again, client will decide whether to retain or not. Client is telling, you know, sending client then is telling the, um, the broker that I want to retain it, please keep it, right? And so then this will help to when future clients will get, you know, that, that they will get this retain message when subscribing to the topic. So, so this actually, if you think about it, will speed things up because there's no need, essentially too, if this client send the, this last message and I tell the broker to keep it. So then next time, if there's a client that subscribe to this topic, the same topic, the retained message will get then get sent over to the 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 uh, broker. Uh, no, sorry, to to the uh, subscriber accordingly too. So this kind of helps with in in terms of a bit more of a more efficiency kind of aspect, right? And and if you know that okay, I'm kind of um, I I you know I'm want to make sure that this is the last known good value. I want that to be kind of shared among you know other clients that will be subscribing to this topic too without actually you know, relying on another publishing client to publish and other messages. So, so there's a certain usages too that can be kind of uh, make use of this retained message too. Now let's get kind of get then into the quality of services. As I mentioned, there are three levels. So there's essentially zero, one, and two. So, so quality of service zero, it means at most one's delivery. It's sort of like a fire and forget kind of a scenario. And then QoS 1 is at least once delivery. QoS 2 is exactly, oh, actually, uh, yeah, QoS 1 is at least one. And then QoS 2 is exactly once delivery. But as you can see too, in the QoS 2, if you see the arrows, right, it's from the uh, publishing side sending to the uh, broker side, broker will kind of go back um, and acknowledge it. And basically too, it requires like a duplicate, uh, always kind of comes in pair. You need to have two pairs of um, kind of direction going in this case. And the, the, the thing with the QoS2 is that it really guarantees that only the messages only kind of get once uh, delivered only once uh, like that. So as you can see, it's a bit performance intensive. The most kind of that, you know, that takes more time than the rest of the uh, levels of services. But let's kind of drill into each one of them. So QoS one, uh, zero, let's start with zero. That's actually the simplest one and also the fastest. Why? Because it doesn't require the uh, broker to send an acknowledgement. So essentially it's the publishing side that says, okay, uh, or whoever is that sending right over to the broker is that, okay, I'm sending you this packet and um, you know, there's no need for you to, to uh, send me back the acknowledgement. And in fact, because of that, even the packet ID does not need to be identified because from the publishing side too, it's more like, I'm going to send this message, you know, and send it to you. You just take it, right? Even if, if you, does, you don't get it, you don't tell me, I don't really care so much. And just as long as I send it, fire and forget. And, and that's what it is. So as you can see, it's very fast because it doesn't require the broker to do another round of sending back an egg. Now, quality of service, uh, service is one. If you kind of, we just look at it, it means at least once. So as you can see too, the client is going to send, to publish the message and send it over to the broker. So let's say, right, um, I have uh, a keep alive a time of 60 seconds, but for some reason, somehow the broker didn't send back a reply. So in that case too, then on the publishing, the client publishing uh, publisher side will say that, well, I never got back. So here I am, I'm going to send another one. So in that case too, it, you can see, well, over this example doesn't show it, but essentially too, the, the, the duplicate flag would be turned on when I resend it. Now, the thing is with this case is that this means that uh, on the broker side, I may be receiving the same messages twice too. And it's basically, uh, that's why too, um, this will mean at least like twice delivery. Maybe the first delivery take, took longer too, and maybe it happens after, you know, it times out, for example. So essentially too, using QoS uh, 1 um, may be faster because it only, it doesn't, um, what you okay, say, you send the same same packet over, but the thing is you, you are waiting for that act. If that act doesn't happen again, uh, it doesn't happen within the reasonable time, then I send another one, but it can be acknowledged again. But in the meantime, the first send could be also getting back another act too. So basically 
it, this means that the same messages can be duplicated. Now you may be wondering then, then you know, in what cases will you kind of use QoS one? So a lot of times too, for example, you are doing a, a bunch of like sensors that you want to kind of have the the sensor be sending data over to uh, you know kind of to the to the broker, and you may be collecting all of these um, information to for plotting a graph, right? A, a graph of data to to monitor. Uh, maybe temperature changes and things like that. But in some cases too, you don't really care, even if you get uh, you know duplicate messages and I will still be gathering all of these data too. And maybe I don't care, you know, even if I get double the, the, the amount of data, accuracy isn't as much of my concern. So that will just be an example, but it guarantees a little bit faster too in this case. So that's QoS one. Now QoS two, now let's take a look at it. It means at, at, uh, at uh, actually, it means exactly one, right? And no more and no less. So let's see how you can guarantee that, right? So we're doing a client to be sending messages over to the broker. So first time I publish using QoS2. And then the broker first got it too, is that um, as you can see, it sends back actually a REC, a REC. It's basically kind of like receive in this case. So I receive it, but this is only the first round, <laughs> the, the first round of the handshake, right? And then basically the client said, okay, cool. You know, I the packet comes back is the same packet that I sent from the first one. So that's cool, you got it. Let me tell you that I received your, your receipt, right? So in that case, I send another one over to the broker. So I'm kind of sending it double. In this case too, I also want to make sure there's no duplicate too. I don't allow any duplicate. So basically if I, you know, already receive it, then that means I'm done. And then in this case, then the broker will then send back a pop come, this essentially means uh, completed over back to the client. So this way you make sure that, okay, you know, he got it and only got it once and I won't reprocess what has already been received, kind of like that. So this extra step, it will take longer, but it guarantees that a message can only be delivered exactly once. So that's what Q QoS2 is. And you can see it's more performance intensive, but the accuracy is very high, the highest in this case. Now, okay, so those were the kind of the major features for uh, MQTT 3, 3.1.1. And, and also let you know is that MQTT 5 has all of it from MQTT 3. Um, so, but before we get to MQTT 5, let's take a look at MQTT 4. Is there actually one? But where is it, right? You may be wondering. Now, the thing is, let's take a look. It's a bit of a trivia in this case. It really doesn't matter how we call it. But I just want to point out too, let's take a look at the connect message packet detail for MQTT 3.1.1. So if you take a look in this packet of a connect, right? So kind of all these things, right? Let's not worry about it. But let's take a look at this field that's highlighted. It's called version. So the version indicates too that this connect message the four indicates it is for MQTT 3.1.1, that, that version uh, level of the protocol. Now, the thing is, if you map 3.1.1 to four, and then when it comes out with uh, MQTT 5, then it names the packet version five in this case. So they were thinking that, well, if I name it version five for that particular connect message packet, it's probably I should kind of align it better with the versioning of the of the protocol itself. And so from version five, then they decide to let's name it MQTT five. So therefore they skip and not having a, a MQTT four in this case. So that again, that's just, just a bit of a um, trivial. So just in case you wonder. Now, some key, key features of MQTT five, we quickly move on to MQTT five. Essentially two is successor of MQTT 3.1.1 and there's non-backward compatibility too. And the first public release was in January of 2018, and the official release was in March of 2019. There were many new features, and essentially they are clarifications of the 3.1.1 specification. The goals of MQTT 5 is essentially their enhancements for scalability and large scale systems. And it's also got improved like error reporting and it formalized certain common patterns, including like capability, discovery, and request response pattern. And there's also this extensibility mechanisms that include like user properties and a lots of uh, performance improvements and support for small clients. 
first of all, let's just uh, we'll just pick on a few, you know, among you know many new features. But these, I think, may be kind of more interested uh, for if you're interested uh, further into this uh, level five. Now, bear in mind too the the MQTT five uh, version is basically came out in 2018, 2019, just when right Kubernetes already been in place for three or four years. So it really. This version, uh, this uh, this specification is trying to address the needs as you know the world gets more and more complicated with cloud computing and cloud native type of system, and it's kind of built more for resiliency, scalability, uh, and durability type of uh, needs. So, first of all, about session and message expiry. So it's it's actually an optional part of the connect message. And session expiry interval are in seconds, and the broker expires session after the given interval, as soon as the client disconnects. So it's, it's gives, giving it a bit more control over, you know, how the session can be disconnected. It can get disconnected once you already receive the, the messages. And it, it's kind of a, gives you a more fine grain level of control from that perspective. And the publication expiry interval is an optional part of a published uh, message too. And it applies to online and also queued messages too. So that's an interesting thing, right? It's allowing for messages queuing in this case too. And then there's also the, the user properties. Um, these are basically um, extensible kind of me mechanism for also for uh, defining your data in your uh, you know, data on the metadata on your header too, and can be most uh, a part of most of the MQTT packets like connect and pop and sub too. These are uh, UTF-8 encoded strings. And basically you can have define as many user properties uh, as you need to. You can add as many as possible. And this essentially goes in with the metadata header. And then another, uh, the third uh, key features would be, I would say, is a shared subscription. So again, this particular uh, features too, uh, essentially is to help to scale out like backend subscribers. So let's say, right, in, in essentially it's dealing with like client low balancing, you want to have multiple clients share the same subscription too in that case. And also it's supported by HiveMQ for MQTT 3.1 and MQTT 3.1.1. That's an actually interesting thing too about HiveMQ because it, it has been like so much in advance of doing MQTT work that in fact in MQTT 3.1, their support and essentially HiveMQ, it already has this feature even before MQTT 5 uh, came into being too. So that's kind of wanting to highlight that. Um, essentially too, again, it's about helping, you know, clients to upscale and downscale at runtime, you know, essentially. And it's really perfect for cloud native scenarios, especially for if you're running your servers, you know, in Kubernetes cluster and things like that. And this actually is essentially an optional feature and it's not supported by all vendors too. But also bear in mind is that HiveMQ is quite sophisticated. The broker is, uh, you know, implementing the MQTT5 features completely too. Now, this is just a, a picture is worth a thousand words. Just want to show, right? You have your broker, you have the publish, uh, publishing client, then basically you have subscriber that can subscribe to, um, or multiple clients subscribing to the same topics in this case. So that's share subscription. Now, there's also uh, a fourth uh, key feature I like to point out is about request response uh, kind of pattern. Bear in mind, it isn't HTTP. This is actually request response pattern. It's more uh, for the business uh, acknowledgement level. So it's not synchronous in nature too, not like the uh, HTTP style of request response. So basically uh, requests as well as responses, they are at least like topics, right? And can have more than uh, one or no subscriber in MQTT. The client must subscribe to a response topic prior to sending the data to. And it's basically, you want to kind of coordinate. So then there are correlation data in the header for like correlating, you know, your requests and your response in a particular kind of usage scenario. Again, more for the business level acknowledgement. Now, this is you know, the, the, the picture that deals with it. You're a broker. That's basically, um, you do need to subscribe to the, the uh, topic before it's being sent to. So likewise, too, on the uh, the other side, too, on your on your application subscriber side, too, you do the same thing. So, okay. So MQTT in summary, um, 
essentially too, that benefits, right? That's my topic. Is that why is it beneficial? Because it is very lightweight and it's bandwidth efficient. So every message works as a discrete chunk of data that's opaque to the broker. An MQTT control packet is actually very small. It contains a fixed header, two byte only. And so there's also a variable header, but the variable ones, actually, it's not even required. If you don't need it, there's no need for it. So you can, all you need is just a two byte header uh, that will be sufficient for sending, right? So very tiny, very small. And, the, and then also the payload. So basically the variable header can be up to 12 bytes of additional variable header in there. But again, it's not needed. If you don't need it, there's no need to have it. And the nice thing too about MKTT is also very data agnostic. So you can send all kinds of data like images, you know, binary data, encrypted data, text in any encoding format. You can do that. JSON, you name it, you can do it too. So. And also the continuous session awareness. So basically the broker does a lot of the heavy duty lifting for you. It persists all of the sessions messages, right? So it stores the messages when offline. So in a, in a scenario in which the network is not really reliable, the broker will help you to uh, make sure that, you know, if the network comes back, that it will has, it has the messages and can deliver it accordingly, you know, to the subscribers too. And basically to uh, retain messages, we just talked about last will and testaments, right? And client can also specify a message to send in case it disconnects and that's the last will um, kind of uh, capability. Very useful in IoT, especially over unreliable networks. So some of the use cases for MQTT, so internet of things, machine to machine, device to device, but there's also the industrial internet of things too that are in factory automations. Industry 4.0. So we're kind of in the industrial revolution version 4.0 now. We're talking about multiple things interconnected with one another using different protocols and we're trying to connect as many things as possible. Make, make sure that they can communicate, right? Data at rest or in, in transit too. And then all of the industry verticals that I talk about in the IoT stack too, right? Automotive, logistics, manufacturing, energy, you name it, anything too. Consumers, smart home life, lifestyle kind of products too. Integration with other frameworks. So you can actually connect that with streaming platforms like Kafka and then other MQTT brokers too, right? Uh, for example, Eclipse Mosquito, that's a C and C++ implementation. There's also Apache Vern, which is in Go. So all of these two, you can actually have brokers talking to one another as well. And you can have runtime such as Spring Boot, Spring Integration as well. And some of the alternative protocols to MQTT include, you can do HTTP, um, HTTP, but it's not really recommended because HTTP, well, HTTP is stateless, but it's actually only good for like one-to-one -one type of scenario. You know, it maintains a session, but it's very heavy, heavy duty. So it can scale very well, right? And if you need to send, you know, one kind of one-to-many kind of scenario, it doesn't work quite well, as we all know. And then there's also this uh, pro protocol called Constrained Application Protocol, CoAP. It's basically makes use of UDP, so User Datagram Protocol, and it's less reliable because it's fast, but it's kind of less reliable. It's a client-server type of uh, scenario too. And then there's also AMQP. For example, like RabbitMQ is an a AMQ uh, QP protocol that's also uh, Oasis kind of governed too. It came out from financial industry and it, you can also use it for IoT, but probably a bit more catered towards more the financial kind of side of things. And then there's also on the factory level too, there's OPC UA, which is object linking and embedding for process control, unified architecture. It's a bit kind of heavier duty uh, kind of uh, scenario is really catered again, more for factory uh, type of uh, automation. Um, and then there's also data distribution service. And as such too, is really handles more of the data side of things too. Uh, then there's also one uh, one last here that I've listed uh, that, that you can have other protocols too, but there's also extensible messaging and presence protocol, which is XML based, the X XMPP protocol. Um, in fact, was Google messaging, for example, is making use of that. So it's catered a bit more for instant messaging type of scenario. So essentially too, we use I, uh, MQTT because we want to achieve IoT scale. Like we want to have Two millions, two point at least two point seven million publishers per minute, like hundred thousand topic subscriptions, and you know x amount a thousand 
um, X hundred thousand connected devices and a hundred thousand Q publishers for one Q two. So it's so fast, you know, everything that you can actually scale up really, really fast. So ideal for device to device, machine to machine, internet, IoT conditions. Okay, let's kind of take a really quick look now into the uh, high MQ uh, cloud. So I wanted to kind of point this out. So if you go to the uh, cloud.hivemq.com, now I have that link towards the end of my slides too. So if you see that, then this is uh, what you do. And basically in this case, I've already set some uh, something up and basically I will have, let's say I have this, right? Okay, and uh, we'll come up in a second. Okay, here we go. So you can actually, for HiveMQ, like I said, I highly recommend because it is a very uh, efficient MQTT broker too. So you can then quickly, see this is already launched in, in kind of real time. Oh, that's okay. So it's running already. So you can go to manage cluster and basically you can kind of take a look, right? Port TLS 8883. You, there's also a WebSocket uh, connection at 8884 and all of these things, and you can uh, do all these things, and you can go to access management, um, and uh, see, I already set that up, so I've already got the MQTT credential. The first time, though, if you set it up, it will ask you to set up your credential, too. And then in this case, let's go to getting started. As you can see, it gives you examples and how you can actually get started. You can write your first MQTT clients. Um, it, you can use MQTT uh, CLI, the command line tool, or mosquito.fx, or mosquito pub sub, or the Hive MQ WebSocket client. And let's take a look because you can also write your code in all these different flavors. You, because the beauty of pub sub is that you can actually use different languages and connect to the broker. It works the same way as long as you follow the, um, the, the protocol, right? And so that's what it is. So let's take a really quick look at the browser tool. So basically this thing is a really convenient thing. You can kind of take a look, right? It's pretty cool. Just want to quickly show. So in this case, it's already kind of set up in here. So um, let me, okay, let me connect. Okay, now I'm connected. And so now let's quickly test it, right? Let's kind of do a subscription first. I will subscribe and test topic to anything, a pound for wildcard, subscribe. Okay, now on my publishing side, I'll say test topic slash one. That's what I'm going to, uh, you know, kind of publish to. I'll say, hello, hello, uh, techno friends, uh, friends, right, and publish. See, then now you can quickly test it. And basically it printed out and say, hello, techno friends. So as you can see, it's, it's very highly efficient too. Again, you know, try this out and give it a try and just to kind of get a feel of how it works, right? Pops up messaging, how does it work in an IoT? And you can kind of connect things on Raspberry Pi, Arduino, you name it, right? You can do that. Okay, so with that, let me kind of go back in here. That's the uh, HiveMQ cloud that you can sign up with. Yeah, so please uh, scan this if you want, or I'll, I'll give you, you this uh, slide too. So don't, don't worry, even if you miss it uh, during this presentation. And I also want to invite you to follow my Twitch stream every Wednesday at two, about 2 p.m. U.S. Central Time. I will be doing different things at Java, open source, distributed messaging, event streaming, cloud, DevOps, and you name it. You can tell me what you like too, and I have my Discord channel. And this is my Twitch uh, TV uh, URL, so please uh, join me there. And then these are some of the resources, right? They're mqtt.org, the ebook from HiveMQ, the, the MQTT Essential Series, this is really good start to, it's very detailed um, about the MQTT 3.1.1 and MQTT 5. And there's all, Oasis open too, if you're interested to read about that. And with that, thank you so much. And again, this is how you can get in touch with me, my uh, Twitter handle, my LinkedIn uh, profile, and also my Discord uh, channel. So I invite you to connect me on Discord and let's continue the conversation. Thank you again for joining me.